Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can I have your attention, please? Can I invite you to take your seats? Welcome to the 19th edition of the Brussels Economic Forum. We're delighted to see so many of you here in the room and also welcome to those who are watching on uh, the live stream. We're live on the uh, website of the Brussels Economic Forum, also on Facebook, Twitter, and Europe by satellite. As always, we're looking forward to a lively and interactive debate. Uh, this is not just uh, about the participants uh, on the stage, it's also those of you in the audience and those following on Twitter. So we encourage you to keep your phones on and to download the conference app uh, where you will find a lot of useful information as well as the program publications. Uh, you will also be able to message other participants. So if you haven't already uh, downloaded the app, please do so. And we would encourage you to uh, tweet your questions using the uh, conference hashtag EUBEF19 and uh, the tweets will appear on the Twitter wall uh, on the screen behind me and uh, there will be a chance that your question will be picked up by the moderator. You can also uh, put your questions using the Slido uh, application in your web browser and the, the best questions are the questions which have the most support from the audience will surely get picked up by our moderators. I just wanted to uh, thank uh, our impressive uh, lineup of speakers this year. Um, as always, we, we have a great lineup of speakers, and I'm particularly proud that this year we have achieved uh, gender balance in our speakers. Uh, and this is something we've been working towards for a number of years, and we're delighted to have achieved it this year. Uh, one other, or two other new features I would like to mention uh, outside the hall, you'll have seen that there is a uh, a photo booth where you can uh, have your photo taken uh, as a souvenir of, of the day, so please don't hesitate to do that. And also another innovation this year, we're delighted to inaugurate a new uh, TED-style talk called Broader Horizons um, to provide a bit of inspiration and a bit of fresh thinking, and uh, Stephanie Stancheva will be gi giving that inaugural talk this year. So we're very happy to have her here amongst us. So I'll leave it at that, and I'll now hand over the floor to the Director General of DG Economic and Financial Affairs, Marco Buti. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, let me thank the organizers, uh, first of all. We do it at the end uh, normally, but uh, I think uh, um, an enterprise like this uh, is, uh, is a pretty big business, and uh, I'm delighted to see you all uh, here, but it requires a lot of organization. So uh, many thanks to Philip and the, and the team. Uh, this is the uh, 19th uh, um, Brussels Economic Forum, You're just one year younger than the euro. Um, coming at, the, at a crucial time. I have to say, every year we say the same thing. We come at a crucial time, but this year is really true. Uh, um, just after the European Parliament elections, uh, uh, in a week which is uh, pre politically pretty charged, uh, you have the uh, um, European Council, actually the Euro Area Summit at the end uh, of the week. Um, important decisions, um, possibly, white smoke on uh, uh, big appointments uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the main institutions. Uh, let's see, let's hope that uh, the um, heads will be inspired uh, um, the day after tomorrow and, uh, uh, and Friday. Uh, so we are here and the ambition uh, is, um, is very simple. We, we will offer them uh, the new economic policy agenda for the next five years. So, we put the bar as high as it should be. Um, new economic agenda, uh, indeed. I think there are many uh, issues that we, um, we, we will have to discuss. Uh, I mean, there is uh, a sense, uh, it came out already in the um, very good debate this morning at the breakfast meeting on the, um, on the roots of populism and the policy responses. There is a sense that the economic paradigm is shifting, uh, the political paradigm also, and uh, uh, the population is not ready to take the established uh, uh, ready-made answers for, um, without, without question, questioning them. Um, so I think we have uh, um, 
broadening of the agenda. We have several transitions. We have the, the ecological, the economic, uh, um, economic transition. We, we have the aging uh, issue. So, uh, in a sense, we have to marry uh, here the short term as well as the medium uh, to long term and uh, try to find a place for Europe uh, uh, in this. So actions at the national level, but actions at the uh, European level, how Europe can shape um, the uh, new global uh, order uh, in a situation uh, that is uh, of uh, you know, political disarray uh, at, the global, at the global level. We are going to have uh, the uh, Osaka G20 summit uh, uh, actually next uh, week. So we'll offer the agenda for them as well. So just to be, uh, to be very, um, very modest in our uh, purposes. Um, as uh, uh, Philip indicated, we have a great lineup of uh, speakers. Uh, we cover uh, the, whole, uh, uh, the whole spectrum. And um, as now is uh, tradition in the, in the um, Brussels Economic Forum, um, we will start with the um, Tommaso Padua Schioppa uh, lecture. Um, it is the eighth uh, lecture. Uh, it is in the honor of one of the uh, intellectual for uh, forces behind the European integration, uh, one of the main founding fathers of the uh, of the Euro, of Economic and Monetary Union, and as I always recall uh, uh, every year, uh, someone who um, at the end of the 70s actually had the position that I'm holding uh, now. He was Director General of the European Commission at the moment in which uh, was, was a moment transition, of transition also. You end the uh, end of the 70s, uh, second oil price shock, the setting up of the European monetary system, so the forerunner of the uh, economic uh, uh, and monetary union, so also uh, a period charged uh, with political and economic, uh, economic challenges. Um, Tommaso Tappadua Schioppa looked at Europe as uh, what he defined uh, in Italian, la forza tranquilla, so the quiet uh, uh, power, and if one looks at the uh, kind of uh, dynamics and debate worldwide, uh, I think we really need a quiet uh, power, but a solid and, solid and steady uh, one. Um, Tommaso was also, also so, uh, as a uh, member of the executive board of the, um, uh, of the ECB at, at its uh, inception, uh, as the um, absolutely necessary to find at the right cooperation between governments and the central banks. It, um, it, at the time, it was uh, not uh, um, a well-accepted uh, concept. And in fact, uh, the ECB, um, because of its newness, um, was very suspicious of uh, dialogue and cooperation with governments. Uh, because it was said as you know, possibly undermining uh, the independence of the monetary authorities of the, uh, of the ECB. So uh, some at the time saw the ECB as um, confronting a dis uh, dispersed powers at the government level as an element of strength for the, uh, for the ECB to affirm its independence. Tommaso had exactly the opposite view. And he saw at the time that uh, um, the risk of excessive lowliness of the, of the ECB in Frankfurt exposed to possible, we did not call that at the time, uh, populist pressures actually uh, pot potentially undermining the, the role and the power of the ECB. And he saw the cooperation with governments as also as a way to shield the, uh, uh, the ECB. I'm talking about this because uh, um, now we are facing a number of challenges which actually require a coordinated response uh, in a cooperative uh, um, venture between uh, monetary fiscal uh, policy, uh, uh, policy authorities. Um, the, uh, Tommaso was also wary of uh, the typical allocation of uh, tasks according to which for the uh, stability fiscal, financial was for Europe to preserve and 
growth equity was for the, for the, for the member states. So this division uh, of this allocation of competencies, actually, he thought it was not a political equilibrium. And I have to, uh, and if you look at the latest uh, developments, I think he was uh, uh, absolutely uh, right. So for the uh, Tommaso Padua Schioppa lecture this year, we have uh, uh, Sir Christopher Pisserides. Um, he is uh, uh, well known, uh, holds the um, Regius Chair of Economics at the London School, uh, um, London School of Economics. Uh, he is uh, uh, main contributor on many of the issues that actually have, uh, I have mentioned on the future of Europe, but in particular on uh, labour market, for which he was awarded back in 2010 the uh, Nobel Prize for uh, um, uh, for economics. So I think he will be. Um, it is going to be very interesting to see his view, his vision on. Uh, uh, what the future of the labour markets uh, um, in Europe uh, is, and also to what extent uh, could uh, uh, the European level, uh, compared to the national level, help in tackling the, um, uh, the main challenges that we see, which is key in uh, uh, you know, making sure that we move to a more inclusive uh, model of growth. So, um, big applause for Chris, uh, who I welcome on the stage. Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for that. It's a, indeed a real great honor for me to deliver the, uh, Padua, the Tommaso Padua Schioppa lecture at this year's Brussels Economic Forum. When I think of the greatness that was uh, Tommaso, and I see the list of the distinguished uh, speakers that preceded me, I get my why me moment. I never really got to know Tommaso at the personal level since, uh, well, I met him, but I never really got to know him well. Um, since when he was busily sorting out Italy's economic woes or building up Europe's monetary union with a grand vision for the future, I was locked up in my cubbyhole at LSE trying to understand unemployment and the plight of those without work. But I once attended a conference in Italy where the um, unforgettable, at least to me, Franco Modigliani was the star attraction. And I remember him well having an argument with the organizers that he had only agreed to come when he was told that Tommaso Patio Schioppa was going to be present, and yet he wasn't. This man must be great, I thought, if Modigliani is going to have an argument with the organizers about it. And indeed he was. Tommaso is one of those great Europeans in a line that goes up to Robert Schumann and his contemporaries, which incidentally included Winston Churchill, who in 1946 called for the United States of Europe. So I do hope our future Prime Minister in Britain remembers that. And uh, we owe to him the big drive that led to the establishment of the Euro and the European Central Bank. That's to Tommaso, not to Churchill, by the way. We owe a lot of things to Churchill, but not the Euro. His concern was to introduce a common monetary policy that would cut the knot of the inconsistent quartet, as he called it. And despite the initial teething problems that we all know, that we all know very well, and I guess us Greeks know more than any other, I think we got there in the end. We have a good currency. Now, for today's presentation, however, I take my lead from last year's presentation from uh, President Juncker, who told us that coming out of the financial crisis, we made jobs and growth our number one priority in Europe, his own words, that, and that we must ensure that our recovery benefits everyone. We are reminded that this was a theme close to Tommaso's heart, as it should be to every Europeans, and this is my theme today. Now, work takes many different forms, from working in the market for a wage to home production, the unpaid work of millions of people providing free services to family and friends. The things that we do at work are changing all the time. The most fundamental cause of this change is technology. Technology brings new methods of production, and economic growth, and with economic growth we can work less and yet have a better quality of life. More and better goods and services, and more time for leisure and intellectual pursuits. 
But although it's the main cause of change, technology is not the only influence on work. Technological knowledge today is as readily available worldwide as it has ever been. Yet, even in countries as closely connected as the ones of the European Union, there is still a lot of variation in the kinds of work people do. Important among the other factors are how much new technology and what types of it are taken up by businesses. It's government policy at both the micro and macro levels and the country's international competitiveness and its openness to trade. Governments have a big role to play here to ensure that there are good outcomes out of new technology. New technology does not benefit all sectors of the economy uniformly. Some sectors benefit more, raising their output at the existing distribution of work, whereas others may not benefit at all. Accompanying the introduction of new technology, there is a shift in employment allocations across industrial sectors known as the structural transformation. And although it has attracted less attention by economists than the growth effect of new technology, it is equally important when considering the, the impact of new technology on jobs and the future of the labor market. My lecture today is about the structural transformations brought about by new digital technologies associated mainly with robotics and artificial intelligence and the transitions of workers across sectors and jobs made necessary by such structural transformations. Although much has been written about the disruptive effects of new digital technologies and the risks they pose to many jobs, much less has been said about the job creation that will accompany the introduction of digital technologies. The challenge that societies in Europe face as the new technologies enter production is not whether there will be enough, good, enough work for people to do, but whether they're prepared to make the transition to a world where labor works with robots and intelligent machines for the betterment of society. Achieving higher incomes through productivity gains due to fast computer speeds and tireless robots is the easy part. Achieving standards of good work for all who want to work and the good quality of life in our cities is the bigger challenge. Now, Industry 4.0, as the Germans call it, the fourth industrial revolution, as the World Economic Forum calls it, digitalization, uh, are all terms referring to one fundamental change in today's economy the availability and introduction of new production methods based on digital technologies. Automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, and more reliance on capital than labor. Although research on robotics and artificial intelligence started many years ago, in the 1950s in fact, commercial applications are much more recent. The key reason is data. AI needs big data. Computers are programmed to process data and take action on the basis of that data. The data processing might be related to the rules of a well-structured game like chess, or it might be the matching of a face to millions of faces available in a data bank. Data is the food of machines when we're talking about artificial intelligence. Alongside the development of the big data banks came improvements in digital technologies like computers with very large processing capacities and robots with independent movement. So how are labor markets responding to these changes and what should we expect from the future? As with all technological developments, the penetration of AI and robotics to the economy is not uniformly spread. Virtually all recorded production robots are in manufacturing with a concentration in the manufacture of transport equipment. AI is used in situations in which the employee is processing data and performing routine tasks that can be programmed, like checking the balance in a bank account or searching past litigation decisions for information about the likely outcome of a case in court. Situations where the employee has to respond to unpredictable behavior, such as looking after a child or giving tuition, cannot be taken over by the new technologies, although they may be able to help the performance of a person who takes charge. Work by the OECD and the McKinsey Global Institute, amongst others, has concluded that about 15% of jobs over the next 15 to 20 years are at risk of automation. Moreover, since the jobs that involve data processing and the performance of routine office jobs, as well as most of the others in manufacturing taken over by robots, 
a jobs normally done by workers with mid-range skills, the expectation is that most of the jobs lost will be in that range. We are already seeing these changes taking place. Ghost, Manning and Salomons, at, working at the LSE, I should add, calculated that in the 15 years prior to 2010, European countries lost about 8% of job positions in occupations that paid mid-range wages. They gained 3% of jobs in lower paying occupations and 5% in high paying occupations. So the middle spread out below and above. We also know that manufacturing employment is falling rapidly, even in Germany, and the main reason is technology adoption that increases productivity whilst reducing the labor input at the same time. These changes are important for the future of work because they give an indication of the type of workers that will need to be relocated over the next two decades. But they're also important because of the distributional implications that they have. In particular, the rise in inequality. As jobs that pay mid-range wages disappear and are replaced by jobs paying more, or less, a gap is open in the middle and wage inequality increases. This is known in the literature as the polarization of employment. They polarize left and right. And it is one of the reasons for the observed rise in wage inequality. Inequality is not my main theme today, but its implications both for in-work poverty and the risks of political extremism are sufficiently alarming that governments need to take er urgent action to avert it. Rather than spend more time on the job destruction and inequality implications of new technologies, I want to devote the rest of my time to the positive aspects of them. Living standards can increase and the new technologies can be used for the improvement of the quality of life in several dimensions, such as public and private health, the environment and working conditions. But for everyone to enjoy the benefits of new technologies, growth has to be inclusive and involve more provision for public goods, which can only be supplied by governments. There is no surer way to achieve inclusive growth than through employment. Although government transfers have an important role to play as workers move across employment sectors, their role must be temporary for each worker in transition. So where are the jobs coming from to replace the ones lost in machines? That's the big question. Any activity that involves judgment independently of data processing will remain in human hands. The vast, ma the vast majority of these jobs are in the service sectors of the economy. The key property of the new jobs that are being created is their non-routine nature. Looking after, looking after mental patients is the ultimate example of a job that will never be taken over by robots. But there are many more. Any type of care, be it for patients, hotel customers, or people training in the gym, will remain in human hands because the situations in which the provider of the service has to deal with is personal to the customer. <clears throat> Although there is always a lot of uncertainty when forecasting in economics, I can say with fairly good confidence that if I had to name two sectors of the economy, which will create plenty of jobs in the age of automation, they will be the health and care sector and the hospitality and entertainment sector. Both sectors are ones that provide services that can be called luxuries in the sense in which the economist uses the word, meaning that as incomes rise, spending on them rises by more than in proportion. In addition, in the health and care sector, spending is also increasing over and above the levels expected from the growth in living standards because of population aging. In the European Union as a whole, the old age dependency ratio is expected to go up from 31% in today 15 to 54% in 2050. In other words, currently the number of people over 65 are about one third of those in the working age group of 20 to 64 years, and in about three decades is expected to increase to one half. That obviously will require more health and care. Historically, spending on health and care has increased by about 2% more than the growth in incomes. Across countries, wealthy societies like France and Germany spend about 12% of their GDP in health and care, 
whereas less wealthy societies like Greece and Bulgaria spend 8%. In terms of employment, the contrast is even bigger. The Nordics employ 15 to 20% of their workers in this sector, France and Germany about 12%, and Greece and the formerly planned economies of Eastern Europe, about 5%. There's a huge difference of more than 10 percentage points between North and South. The economies that have low employment rates in this sector are also ones that either have low overall employment rates, especially for women, or too high manufacturing employment to be justified by today's manufacturing technologies like the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Taking also into account population aging, we can say with some confidence that if the worker transitions from out of the labor force and from the automated jobs are handled correctly, job creation in the health and, health and care sector can contribute substantially to the convergence of, sec of sectoral and overall employment rates in the European Union. The hospitality industries employ different shares of workers across countries, not only because of differences in their level of economic development, but also because their size depends on other factors, such as tourism and cultural heritage. On the database CLEM's narrow definition of accommodation, food services, and arts and entertainment, these sectors employ about the same number of workers as the health and care sector, and their share has grown fast in recent years, although not as fast as in health and care. The reason for that growth is, is twofold. First, as societies become wealthier, there is more demand for good quality services in hospitality and enter entertainment as a way to spend one's free time. Work-related work travel has also grown as work patterns have become more complex. Second, and ultimately more important for the growth of this sector, as living standards rise, people take more time off work. The gains from a rise in productivity and income are shared between more spending in goods and services and taking more time off work. We're very good in Europe about that, and I think it's a good thing that as you become wealthier, you take more time off work for a better quality of life. In addition, those who work on home production in the provision of services for family and friends for no pay also work less and take more time off as living standards progress. The fall in hours of work and the rise of leisure time is reflected in a very good correlation between labor productivity and annual hours of work across the countries of the OECD. In the European Union, the shortest annual hours of work are found in Germany, whereas the longest hours of work are found in Greece, countries that are at the opposite ends of the productivity rankings. But it goes to show that Greeks are hardworking after all. More jobs will be created across a whole range of services outside the two sectors that I have highlighted. A common characteristic that runs through most of these jobs is the marketization of home production. In less well-off societies, family members, especially female ones, do a lot of unpaid work at home, such as cleaning, cooking, looking after children and aging parents, and many, many more. These activities are well documented in time use surveys. As living standards rise and education standards improve, more and more of these activities are transferred to the market where professionals do them as paid work. In parallel, household members who engaged in these activities come out into the market to find jobs better suited to their skills. There is a substitution between home activities and market activities driven partly by rates of return to service employment, to, sorry, to service production of family members affordability in the face of imperfect markets and tax incentives provided by the government. As an example of the latter, of the tax incentives, the very large participation in health and care market services in the Nordic countries is partly explained by the tax and subsidy incentives given by governments to these services. This is also an explanation of the higher relative overall employment rates in these countries when compared with the other countries of the European Union. When a family is given incentives to take its underage child to a child care center, family members are free to pursue their own work. Two paid jobs are created simultaneously, one for the child care professional and one for the family member, who is usually the mother, who does the child care at home.
I have argued that alongside the destruction of jobs by robots and artificial intelligence, there will be growth of employment opportunities elsewhere in the economy to absorb the displaced workers. A frequently asked question is whether there will be enough good jobs to take over. The hidden message here is that jobs lost to automation are good, whereas the ones that will be created will be less good. There is no evidence of such a discrepancy, and indeed some studies find that the service jobs created will require higher skills than the ones destroyed. Of course, this does not mean that we can ignore the need to look for improvements in work. As society advances and higher standards from service producers are expected, it is natural to expect improvements in the work environment as well. Reports and surveys on the quality of work have proliferated in recent years with the aim of improving work conditions beyond the basic work standards agreed at the International Labour Office. And I'm pleased to see one session this afternoon uh, about this issue. In this connection, economists and policymakers have for long focused on the productivity of jobs and on GDP measures of well-being, ignoring other factors connected with the quality of life. Although this is changing, change is still very slow. Improvements in the quality of, of work and more generally the quality of life, often go against productivity growth, at least in the short run. But a company that works with his employees to improve standards at the workplace, it offers reskilling courses at work and informs its workers of the changes brought about by technology, will experience improvements in both the health standards of the workforce and their motivation. Employment relationships will be longer lasting and there will be a bigger rise in a more general measure of well-being in which GDP, GDP growth is only one component. As for the ability of an economy to create enough jobs, there is no doubt in my mind that a well-functioning economy can create the number of jobs required to employ all those who want to work, taking into account the frictions that every labour market has in which yield and equilibrium and employment rate associated with the normal churning of jobs. The experience of economic growth in the second half of the 20th century is that economies can create jobs without limit, except for the availability of labor willing to do them. One of the most remarkable facts of modern economies, like those of the OECD, is that employment and unemployment rates are more or less the same regardless of size of economy or its natural resources. This is one point where I, it's probably the only point where I disagree with uh, John Maynard Keynes, who wrote that um, by 2050 there will be no more work to do in our economies. I completely disagree with that. He didn't live in the second half of the 20th century, that's why he said it, I think. He didn't have that experience. Now, what about the role of government? Well, I have given a rather optimistic appraisal of work in the world of robots and AI, but needless to say, these things don't happen on their own. All three social partners, workers, companies, and the government have important roles to play in ensuring a smooth transition to the new world. The role of government is especially important in this context, and it's on this that I focus now. With the advent of new technologies, some jobs become obsolete and others are created to take their place. This is a necessary process that needs to be encouraged by government policy, not impeded through restrictive industrial policies. Joseph Schumpeter described this process as the creative destruction of old and established work methods by new entrants, and is, and these are his own words, by the way, the essential fact about capitalism. It is what capitalism consists in and what every capitalist concern has got to live in. Close his own words. Despite his Marxist origins, this view of job churning has wide acceptance today by economists. So in some sense, we are all Marxian in this respect. Governments need to support this process along several dimensions. First, through the removal of overregulation, which acts as an obstacle to the operations of firms. Overregulation touches many dimensions, and especially in our context, the replacement of labor by capital as they adapt to the new technologies. Second, by creating the enabling environment for new, firms to, to en for new firms to enter and take on displaced workers. There are still many obstacles in Europe to the process of creative destruction in the form of excessing, excessive employment protection legislation in some countries and administrative and financial burdens on firm entry. 
Despite the efforts of European Union institutions to oversee the structural reform of many of its members during the financial crisis, the reform process was not an unmitigated success. In my view, partly responsible for this failure was the simultaneous imposition of fiscal austerity on the reform countries, which stifled the reform, the reform process. Reform is successful when it is owned by governments and domestic institutions, but if it's made part of the austerity package, governments will just botch it up. And this is what happened in many. Creative destruction inevitably involves job loss. As I mentioned earlier, the expected job loss from new technologies is placed at about 15 to 20% of employment. This number is not big by the usual turnover rates of employment. It corresponds to the normal job creation and job destruction rates in advanced countries during a single year, whereas the estimates for new technologies span 10 to 15 years. There is, however, one big difference. Whereas the normal job turnover rate is between similar firms, with one firm expanding and another contracting within the same sector, the job loss due to technology involves the replacement of employees by machines with the employees nowhere to go within the sector. They will have to relocate to other sectors, which are likely to be unrelated to what they were doing before. This is where governments have an important role to play, to facilitate the transition of workers from the sectors experiencing the declining employment rates to the new expanding sectors. Training programs and lifelong learning become essential for a successful transition. Training programs are successful when the worker owns the training. In other words, workers do not do the training because they are forced by circumstances or by the threat of government sanctions, but because they think that by doing it, they will improve their condition in the labor market even when compared to what they had before they were displaced. The most successful training programs are ones run by companies because companies know their needs better than government. But given the nature of training with an initial outlay and then the risk of losing the worker to a competitor, government needs to support the training programs through subsidies or tax incentives. Another difficulty, that only large firms, another difficulty is that only large firms can reasonably be expected to be able to offer good training programs, whereas in the service sectors that jobs are being created, most, most employment will be in small and medium-sized uh, companies, with the exception of health, though, where large hospitals would be initially involved or usually involved. In these circumstances, government may take on directly the job of training workers through a combination of training courses and company experience. It's important to have the company experience. In addition to training, governments need to support workers in transition with transfers to avoid the risk of poverty, which would disenfranchise them or make them accept unsuitable and unrewarding jobs just because they happen to be there. In Europe, we have an elaborate system of social support, but standards vary widely across countries. This is one area where there could be closer cooperation between European nations, especially when it comes to causes like technological unemployment. But individual governments are unfortunately resisting it. Finally, I come to an issue that I have neglected for too long. How do we prepare a society for the coming of robots and other intelligent machines? other than the role of government that I just outlined. But here again, government has an important role to play. The new technologies will require new skills. Although reskilling and lifelong learning in later life become more important, in the world of robotics, preparation has to start from school. The worker of the future needs to have a portfolio of skills to deal with a fast-changing work environment that will give her flexibility in adapting to new situations. This portfolio will have to contain the obvious STEM skills, which are the ones most frequently emphasized by politicians, but equally importantly, it will have to include soft skills that will enable the person to work effectively with other people in sectors like care and entertainment. Social skills are undervalued currently and are not taught at school at all. Decades, if not centuries of education have conditioned us to thinking that a proper education is one that teaches science, mathematics, literature, history, and geography, but not soft subjects like sociology and social psychology, and economics, of course. 
This has to change if jobs in these sectors are to become well-paid, respectable and good jobs that young people will be proud to enter. The social status of these jobs needs to rise and the best way to achieve this change, although inevitably slow, is by offering them at school as serious subjects, which is what they are. With this background, standards of service in the workplace will rise, bringing a rise in wages too. Occupations do adapt to circumstances. For example, the appreciation of good food in restaurants is a fairly recent phenomenon, at least in Britain, maybe not in France or in Belgium. <laughs> and it followed the awareness of the importance of food for health and for mental and physical fitness. The result is an upgrading of the social standing of the occupation of a chef, with, with the result that it is now a sought after occupation by young people and it's even treated with glamour in the media. Similar developments should be encouraged in other occupations. For example, more social awareness of the importance of good care based on a broad knowledge of human health and development could elevate the status of the job of the caregiver to higher levels and so raise the financial and social rewards from participating in it. Research and learning at university level are also extremely important given the complexity of the new technologies. Someone will have to invent and develop the next AI software that will drive the machines, and this is done through R&D and through collaborations between industry, government, and the universities. R&D needs government support because of the social benefits from it and the risk that the, social, that the research outcomes might be poached. There is a much differentiated performance in R&D in Europe, with the more successful technology adopters doing even more R&D than the technological laggards. This is not good for the future. It forewarns of even more diversity in technology adoption, productivity growth, and prosperity. The average R&D spending in the European Union is about 2% of GDP, which is small anyway with just over half of it being done by business, the other half by government and universities. But even more important than this low level is the fact that there is almost a perfect divide between the countries of Southern Europe and the formerly planned, planned economies of Central and Eastern Europe, which lie below the average, and the rest, which lie above. The only exceptions are the United Kingdom and Ireland, which are below the line. Given that the countries of, South, of Southern and Eastern Europe are also the ones that are lagging behind in technological development and in the structural transformation away from heavy industry and inefficient methods of organization, the future does not hold promise that they will achieve convergence acting on their own. But the willingness of EU-wide collaboration in this most international of activities like R&D does not seem to be there with the exception of the gallant efforts of the European Research Council, which funded <laughs> this research, by the way, I should say. Now, in conclusion, I want to re-emphasize the optimistic tone of my delivery. Robotics, artificial intelligence, and automation offer vast possibilities for the betterment of our societies. But if we leave the market alone to do it, there is no guarantee that it will do it successfully for everyone. Some people may be left behind, and the transition to the new era may be slower and more painful than it needs be. Governments, in collaboration with employers and workers, can achieve better outcomes. In the European Union, even better outcomes can be achieved in, if the cross-border collaborations within the Union deepen further. Thank you very much for listening.